you the business tips to successfully start and run your business so your business doesn't run you. And more importantly, we provide personal development tools to create a better version of yourself to provide the solid foundation for your life and business to stand upon. This is The Biz Reveal, and I'm your host, Craig Sawyer. With over 25 years as a software marketing executive, Kathy Wells discusses the challenges of shifting the antiquated, misogynistic culture that permeated corporate America and take a look back at how the behavior in a boardroom has changed over the past 30 years. And with over 10 years as a family caregiver, discusses how she has influenced change in the systems that currently shape our aging experience. After the show, learn more at www.serenityengage.com or www. Dot Mavericks of Senior Living dot com. This is the Biz Reveal Podcast with this week's guest, Kathy Wells. So I've worked since I, my entire career has been in software. I have worked for large companies, corporations like Hewlett Packard, down to startups and everywhere in between. And I found my passion is in startups and building and growing something. That's where my superpowers come in. I'm really, really good at building and growing something. And I started my career at Hewlett Packard back in the 90s, 80s, sorry, (laughs) back when Hewlett Packard was a great company to work for. It was like in that era, when you got out of college, you wanted to work for Xerox or IBM or HP. And I got just an amazing idea of what a large national global corporation could look like and how it could run and all the training that they do and their focus on culture and how important culture was. And I thought every company was going to be that way. And I quickly found out that they aren't (laughs) and, and that they're the culture matters. Culture is everything. So when I started my company, And it is my first business, my co-founder. This is his eighth business. He's a serial entrepreneur. So I have that, you know, expertise alongside me. And I've always kind of been second or third in command at many of the smaller companies that I've worked for startups. So I knew a lot, but this time it's all on me. And what I learned in that process is that being CEO does not... Yes, it's a hierarchical thing, but it's much, much more an accountability thing. So not about I'm the boss. Um, I I remember reading an article where uh, it was Jeff Bezos was upset with one of his employees. And he said, do I have to pull out? Do I have to go down to HR and pull out my I'm the CEO (laughs) certificate? (laughs) That's not how I want to run my business. So, (laughs) So we started really with defining our software, but then alongside that, what kind of culture we wanted to create as well. Yeah. And and you said it, I mean, the culture is probably the most important thing about any company. I mean, it really is the foundation of any company. And I've had other shows where we've discussed culture and, and, and honestly what it is, because that's the first thing you got to determine is what is culture. Uh, and then one of the hardest parts is what kind of culture do you want? Uh, and you have yeah. to get pretty defined on that. You have to really narrow that down to what type of people you want, uh, you know, what type of company you want, the overall feeling and everything. So um, when you guys were doing that, was that a joint effort between the two of you then, you and the co-founder? Or was that just kind of, you know, one of you guys is like, hey, I'll just go along with whatever you say. Yeah, I, I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah. So I'm I'm pretty much a take charge person. So I had no problem just stepping into it and defining <laughs> sure. the culture that I wanted to create. But my co-founder gave me some really good insights as well into things that worked for him in previous companies and things that didn't work. And I think that's the one of the interesting things about culture when you're defining it is what do you want it to be and what do you not want it to be? Sure. And that's equally as important. And then it changes with every person you bring in. The dynamics change. It doesn't mean the culture changes, but the dynamics of the way everyone interacts change. And there's a... There's a standard thing in collaboration where we talk about forming, storming, and norming. And the same thing happens when you bring in someone new, especially in a really small, tight-knit 
organization. You know, we're six people, seven people here and three offshore. And so, you know, we know each other really, really well. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, when you're hiring and that's the other good reason to have a culture that you already have planned out that you want, because I think it starts at hiring, right? I mean, they, they have to fit into that culture. You can't always mold somebody to be what you're hoping their you know, your culture is going to be. You have to bring them on, give that expectation right off the bat and, and look for those types of people to help build what you're already building uh, instead of trying to morph it. Uh, people don't take the change too well. And I think a lot of CEOs have, see, have seen that, right? When, you know, they're, uh, they're hired into a company that may be failing or something. And a lot of times the reason a company is failing is because of the culture and what the culture has become, or maybe the culture is still the same and it hasn't evolved uh, with the rest of the business. Then you get a new CEO, CEO in there and they have to change the culture, which is probably one of the hardest things to do because uh, you're changing the personality of the company. Uh, and if you've ever tried to change a personality trait, it's pretty tough, it's, let alone yeah. do it with an entire company. Yeah. Yeah. And, and fortunately with companies, you can, with people, you can't. So you, you really hit the nail on the head when you said it, when you talked about the, the person and the people that you bring in have to match the culture. Yeah. We can't change somebody's personality. We can change behaviors, but we can't change personality traits. Right. And so are they aligned with the things that you believe in? Are they do they personify what you want to personify to our customers? Uh, for example, I'm sending out my director of customer service to our largest customer next week, and he's been fully vaccinated. So he's the first one that gets to go out and, and actually work with our clients. And, and I have zero heartburn over it <laughs> where if it wasn't him, if it was, you know, maybe someone who was newer to the organization or someone that I hadn't already built this trust with. And I know inside and out exactly how he's going to what kind of face he's going to give to serenity when he's out working with the clients. Right. I just have zero heartburn. He's he is um he has exactly the right values for the company. He's been with us for about six months now, a little bit longer, maybe, and just really is going to fit well with what they're needing to have done. So I feel really good about that. But that's where, you know, if you have someone who doesn't match the culture, that's the accountability piece for the CEO. That's why the job is hard. It's not that everyone reports to you and you're the boss. I, I, don't like that. I am fully accountable for the success or failure of this business period. So that means that I need to make hard decisions. If somebody comes in, we've allowed somebody to come in that that is not a good fit for the organization mm -hmm. and do it quickly. It's something I've learned over the years. Yes. Yeah. Never wait uh, because it gets cancerous, right? It, it, it does spread fast. And it, it says to the other employees that you don't care as much about your values as right. you say and your culture as you say. And it's not fair to the person either. They're never going to succeed mm -hmm. if they're swimming upstream all the time. Sure. So when you were uh, starting that up uh, and then, you know, you're not, how many years have you been, uh, has Serenity been? We've been in business for two years. Okay. Um, I had a, a little kind of earlier um, version of it right before that. But yeah, about two years for Serenity. Okay. For, so that first six months, what were the growing pains? The growing pains were really, it, it was really, do we have product market fit? That okay. was the whole thing for the first six months. We had a gr great prototype and... It was my job to go out and talk to people about it and see if I could get someone to buy into the idea. And then we did. And you have a moment of dog catches car. So <laughs> dog chases car, dog chases car, dog catches car. And you go, oh, now what? <laughs> what do I do with the car? Right. Okay, so that's where I was. So I had the prototype and I was out and I was able to sell it. And then I had to come back and say, now we have to write code really, really, really fast. And that's how lean startup works. And a lot of people don't know that, but that's how lean startup, especially in software works. You sell the prototype first, but that's how you get whether it's worth investing your time and money and energy into it. I also spent a tremendous amount of time um, 
on customer discovery interviews and on uh, shadowing people. So really learning, getting into their world and learning what it's like to be inside the senior living community and running a senior living community. There's some really big disconnects between what we think as family, what we think on the outside they do and what they actually do. So it was fascinating to me. So you can't fulfill a need until you know what the actual need is, right? So you're learning where your niche is and where you can fit into that and how you can fix the problems that might be out there because you exactly. can't fix problems that you and, don't know exist. And right? what, what tools do they already have that are sufficient enough? Sure. Um, what tools do we need to integrate with? How are we going to get productivity for them? Uh, how are we going to get users to engage? How do we keep them engaged? How do we help them with the process of uh, rolling it out to their families and create? So interesting. We're talking about culture. Um, what our software actually does is creates a culture shift inside these organizations as well. So whether it's senior living or any other, it's the idea of having transparency and straightforward communication, a great uh, communication channel between caregivers and family members about somebody's care is not something that is done today. So it's really interesting to think about how it impacts their culture and who's open to it and who's not. So in crossing the chasm, the the beautiful um, early adopter curve that's in there, we're definitely on the early adopter curve. So we're looking for people who are forward thinkers, who know that we all live our lives on technology these days. Mm -hmm. We bank from it. We do Zoom calls like this. We, um, you can buy your house, you can buy your car, all of it happens online. You can hardly even see a person and do both of those things, buying these, you know, really big financial commitments. And interestingly enough, this industry in particular is about to undergo that major technology transformation right now. And most of it is because of the the demographics. Sure. Demographics have changed. Is that because of the... Uh... The, the generation that is is now being the primary generation that's going to be in and needing that care? Is that why? Yeah. So the boomers are, um, well, first of all, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 a day for the next 20 years. Wow. So that's a lot. Right. Now at 65, you're probably not moving into senior living, but you're probably going to begin to need some additional help somewhere in your life, whatever that looks like. And that continues to grow. And then it can become home care. It can it can become um, day operations where you can go and do things um, and then it can turn into senior living. And then there's hospice. So there's a lot of people who are serving that market. But the at, it's the beginning of the senior care journey, so to speak, around that time, 65, 70, 75 for some. These are all generalizations. I know 80, 90-year-olds sure. who are living at home and can still kick up their heels. One of them lives in my condo building downtown, <laughs> and it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so everything's a generalization, but... Um, the demographics are shifting. So that means that boomers who still have parents alive are most likely in need of senior care. Mm -hmm. And the children of boomers are now Gen Xers and Gen Yers. And those people, and I'm a avid Gen Xer. I'm a video gamer. I'm a on my phone all the time. Don't call me. Don't leave me voicemail. Text me. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to answer <laughs> if I don't know your number. If you text me, I'll probably get right back to you. Sure. So that's the way we're used to living our life. We expect that to happen. Yeah. Expectations are, business, are shifting. As you do business, you want the business to work the same way your personal life does and vice versa, right? So it just makes it an easy transition. Uh, rather than exactly. having to do one part of your life one way and the other part of a completely different way. Yeah. 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 And do you remember the days when you, if you were buying a car, you had to go visit multiple dealerships mm-hmm. if you really wanted to get information because they're your only source of information. Right. And you had to do all your own research and it was a huge undertaking to go buy a car. And then you had to prepare for the negotiating. Oh, that was and, the worst, right? <laughs> oh, it was crazy. I remember my dad took me when I was 18 um, into a car dealership. We were negotiating on a Honda Prelude for me <laughs> and um, the manager 
was giving him a hard time. And my dad's a hard negotiator. And my dad said, we're leaving Kathy. And we got up and walked out. And the whole time I'm like tears streaming down <laughs> my face. Cause that was the car I wanted. Yeah. And I just think how business has changed. Business has changed so much because of technology and the way we sell has changed. And that that's, what's happening in senior care, that type of transformation. That's good. And it's about time, you know, and I, I can't believe like <laughs> I'm watching TV now and you can literally order a new car online. You you shop for it. They're like, we all do the price shopping now, right? You go to different you know websites and you can price shop and all that. Uh, but now like, uh, was it Carvana? Uh, yep. that you, I mean, they have what they call vending machines, these big buildings that have the elevator that come down. Unbelievable. But just that's ingenious completely ingenious, you know, to make it. And it's kind of weird, though, because in the day and age of social media, right, the last 10, 12 years, um, which is supposed to be bringing everybody together that we're all, you know, able to communicate and all that. But the thing is, we're communicating, but we're never in person. And so there's a lot more impersonal transactions being made, the handshake, especially now with COVID, right? Everything's gone uh, virtual, and yeah. I'm waiting to see what happens when all this is over, because it will end at some point, uh, hopefully sooner than later. But will the handshake come back? You know, things like that. Or are people going to be too scared to touch each other? You know, so I'm really uh, when it comes to business, that's one of the things I fear, because nothing beats that handshake when you when you make a deal with somebody or, uh, you know, you have a contract with somebody or some type of an agreement. That handshake, man, that means everything. So I hope that doesn't go away. Uh, now, I can do without the haggling at the car lot. <laughs> I can certainly do without that. So, and I want to ask you this too, as as a woman in that field, in, in a C-level position as a CEO, as a business owner, um, and especially when you're talking about software, it is a male-dominated industry for the most part. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, we, we know that you had, you know, the typical obstacles with starting a business and getting the the market research and all that stuff. Were there any special cases that you had to overcome because of being a woman in your industry in a leadership position? So not in my current role, but my entire career, yes. Okay. Yes. And so my career is from the mid 80s to now. The reason I say it's not an issue right now is because even probably because of the Me Too movement, there's been so much spotlight put on it and the topic is there and um, people are actively looking for diversity in their organizations of all kinds. And even our investors. So when I go out to raise money 10 years ago, I would have absolutely needed to bring a male with me okay. and probably would have had him speaking rather than me. Not always the case, but. Uh... Of all the ways that we take care of those that we love, the most important is providing the care they need when they need it most. Sawyer Health Solutions. Go to SawyerHealthSolutions.com for a free health insurance quote. Interestingly, now they want to speak more with women. And that's because it, women still only get 2% of the investment money in the United States. So it's still wow. very, very, very small, wow. heavily weighted towards older white males, heavily. Um, that said, it's beginning to change and it's only beginning to change because of the spotlight that's been put on it and that people are actually having the conversations and actively looking for female or minority owned businesses to begin to, um, to invest in and see them grow. And one of our investors, I was talking to him about this very topic, and he said, "It, you know, it's really, really hard to find people to invest in that that fit the that help us round out that side of our business so that we have minorities and females represented because it's all white males who are coming to us. Right. So like the flood of their deal flow is white males. And I'm thinking, wow, what have where what happened? Have you read the book Upstream? I have not. It's a great book. And and if you start to think where upstream are people not people of color and um, people of any any nationality and females, why are they not coming into the deal flows? 
Why are they not starting businesses? What's preventing them from doing that? And I don't have an answer. So I think that's going to play out, though, in the next 10 years. We're going to see a lot more of it. So with the emphasis more, which obviously that's a good thing, uh, with female-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses getting more attention and getting the attention they deserve, why do you think that is? Is it just because of the movement and it's kind of the thing right now? Or are they trying to get a new perspective? Because obviously, if you're getting a bigger perspective – of maybe groups that you didn't have perspective in before, I would assume that if you can start getting that perspective, you might actually expand your reach as well. So could that be part of it? Or what do you think the main reason it, for it is? I think a couple of things. I, I think the, the Me Too movement put a lot of focus on women in general the political environment and the racial tensions in the United States over the last year have put a spotlight on this as well. So I think there's active work towards it, which really probably wasn't the case even five years ago as much as it is today. Well, do you think that was just because they weren't thinking about it before? Like it wasn't like necessarily intentional. Right. It's just now yeah. they're like, oh, wait, you know, maybe we haven't been paying attention. So now that it's actually been brought to the forefront, it just brings it to their attention that it's something that we've exactly. been missing. Okay. Exactly. And, you know, as, as a student of systems theory, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So we're getting the results of, of white males being the majority of the deal flow mm -hmm. because our system is somehow designed to bring that. So what design changes do we need to make in the system that allow this? And I think we're getting people looking at that for the reasons we've been talking about. I also think there's a shift in demographics. Um, just like we talked about in senior care, there are younger and younger investors and they're, they just grew up in a different era where this wasn't the issue and right. there aren't the, the, um, Oh, it's going to fail me. The words, the bias that you don't know you have. Um, there's a word for it. I can't think of it. The prejudices and, though, that, uh, that you're on the subliminal prejudices that you might have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Things that you just don't know that exist in you. Sure. And uh, someone just sent me actually a really great, I can send you the link if you want to put it in the show notes. It's a Harvard study. It's had thousands and thousands of people go through this survey and it, it uncovers your biases and you just go through and answer a bunch of questions and it can be gender, race, um, anything. They have a whole bunch of them. Because we all have them. I mean, human nature, there's, there's always going to be things that, and it's usually the things that we know the least amount about, you know, the things that we're most ignorant about are the things that we're scared of. I, yes. You know, kind of why we're all scared of aliens. I'll tell you one thing. One of the things I'm scared most about is sea life. Have you seen some of these sea creatures? Come on. They're just crazy looking and they freak <laughs> me out. Right. But we don't know that much about them. And that's what scares me. I'm like, I don't know if I touch that thing, if it's going to kill me or not. So typically when we're really, really scared of stuff, it's because we just don't know that much about it. Um, but if we took the time to learn, then we're like, wow, you know, and, and, and staying on the subject of you know, the racial diversity or, you know, gender diversity and things like that. It's because we don't understand each other because we've not taken the time. And like the Me Too movement, I don't think it was, in most cases, I don't think it was an intentional thing. Oh, you know, it might've been back in the day, but you know, it's not like, oh, we're not hiring her because she's a woman. It's just, it wasn't even a conscious thought. I think that, you know, right. that you could consider a woman for that role, you know? So oh, I don't, totally agree. Totally it's, agree. It's crazy. I, it's an unconscious bias. That's the word, yeah. an unconscious bias. Yeah. And yeah, I don't think people in general do it on purpose. There are always bad actors sure. and the bad actors are getting all kinds of attention right now. And um, that's good because they're being called out and their behavior is being stopped yeah, we'll in the an last example of several years. So there's always going to be bad actors, but that shouldn't color the many, many, many people who just were working within the cultures that existed. I can tell you, I was floored when I worked at Hewlett Packard that they came around with a drink cart at four o'clock every day. And that was just part of the culture. It wasn't a big deal. That was a leftover from the seventies. Okay. So it wasn't long after that, that the drink cart stopped. Uh, it started happening only on Fridays after a while. And then, and I lived in LA at the time. So um, maybe it was a little more liberal there. I'm not sure. The 
that so the drink cart eventually then stopped altogether because you know in the early 90s there was there was the mothers against drunk drivers coming out there was um, the awareness of drinking and driving and the the issues that it can cause. So just the that shift in culture. But the thing that really floored me, and I was 23 years old at the time, I had a boss who would tell me stories and totally inappropriate. Okay. <laughs> now it's inappropriate. At the time, I didn't know any different. Right. And no one else did either because that was the culture. But he would tell me how in the late 70s, early 80s, they actually had cots in certain rooms because after people got drinking, they would get a little friendly. <laughs> <laughs> well, so your workplace turned into a brothel. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm sure that HP would never want that story to get out, but everyone who worked <laughs> there in that time knew those stories. Yeah. So it's not like it was expected. It wasn't. It was just, you know, they were coming off the 60s into the early 70s and then it They're kind of prepared. bled over. They're yeah. just prepared. They weren't encouraging it. They're just prepared right. in the event that it was needed. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was always the nap room or something. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you gotta, yeah, you couldn't exactly put brothel on the outside of the door there. It probably wouldn't go over so well. <laughs> right. Right. So, so Which, talking, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. But also, I do want to say, because I'm a big fan of the HP way and the, the culture that they used to have back then, mm -hmm. um, that wasn't really totally aligned with their culture either. Is it, was that something that just kind of morphed? Uh, where I think so. maybe a, yeah. a you know, big group of employees that had just been there for a long time and they were just yeah. in a big friend circle and they kind of just created their own thing. And just kind I of think so. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. And I think there was a lot of that that was the norm in business in the 80s. It was just kind of a normal thing. And that was kind of the height of the good old boy club as well, yeah. I think, you know, in the, yeah. the mid 80s when it was all the, you know, well, as you said, you know, like the white males. Um, probably in their yeah. mid fifties or so, you know, in their fifties that had been around with the company. Cause back then too, you stayed with the company for a long time. You know, yes. you, you are with a company 20, 30, 40 years. Now you're with a company. I, I can't remember what the average is. It's something like five years or eight years. And then you move on. Um, I think it's as our attention spans have gotten shorter. Uh, so, so has our loyalty. Uh, but people are more likely to move to a job where they feel appreciated, um, and, you know, and it's not always about pay. You know, a lot of people will take less pay than and, and want to be happy yes. and feel appreciated uh, than get paid a lot and get treated like crap. Right. So that's and that's you said loyalty. Our loyalty has shortened. I think it's culture. It's all influenced by culture. If it's a bad culture, you're not going to stay. If mm -hmm. it's a great culture and you're getting fulfilled and you're able to grow and learn. I tell my my the people who work with me here at Serenity, I tell them all the time, I want them to grow personally and professionally here. Exactly. And if we're not doing that, we're not doing a full job. Yeah. And so, you know, we create together. We do a lot of collaboration together. We take everybody's ideas in. We, um, we hone it down. We focus. We test it out. We, the ego, every person has an ego. So anyone who says, I don't have an ego, they're lying. Right. But what they are saying is that they're able to put their ego aside. They don't have to look good and, and make decisions based on them looking good. They can make decisions based on what is the, in the best interest to grow this company or solve this problem. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, just, just feeling like you have a purpose when you go to work. I mean, we all want to feel like we're appreciated at home. You know, yeah. you want your, your spouse to appreciate you. You want your children to appreciate you, which they never do, <laughs> but you want right. to feel appreciated in your job. You're at your, at your job, your career more during your waking life than you are anywhere else. So if you don't feel appreciated and valued there, it does do some damage to your psyche and your, and your, you know, just the way you carry yourself. So a lot of people have, have taken that. And that's, I think, again, with the cultural shift, that's part of the cultural shift is uh, because people have been feeling that way for a long time. But, but again, the times were the times and it wasn't something that you really, you know, you might not have felt appreciated, but there wasn't an alternative. I mean, that's how everybody felt. That's how everybody feels at work. So that's how I feel too, you know, and, and now there's like, wait, there's, there's choices out there. I don't have to feel this way. X company down the road treats their employees much better and they value them. I'm going to go over there. And I think that's what happened with the loyalty. And I think some of these companies who have not 
changed with the times. They have not taken note of those types of things, have not uh, given the attention to the personal needs of their employees and, and have only looked at their business needs. Uh, I think that's where they're failing at. And, and, and you're, you're seeing that in stock markets and things like that, the companies that are flourishing, the ones that are not. It's, they're, they're really taking note of what they're – Google. I mean, Google is a perfect example. And when I think of Google, one of the things I think about them is all the crazy stuff that they do for their employees. And their employees stick around for a very long time. I, I wish I had statistics on that, but it's a lot longer than, than the average. And there's a reason for that. So – there is, it goes a long way. there is a reason for that. And, you know, in, in senior care, there's extraordinarily high turnover and that's one of the reasons. Is it now for me, it would be um, because of the emotional toll that it, it could take on me. And if, if I have the type of personality as do many other people, where if I'm around somebody who's hurting, it makes me hurt. It, it kills me inside. I can never be a psychiatrist or psychologist. Uh, I probably couldn't do senior care, not because I don't care, you know, I don't care enough. It's because I care too much and I'd get attached. And ultimately, unfortunately, you can't, you can't do that. Um, is that a big reason for turnover or is it just because, or mainly because of how underappreciated they, those folks might be? It's both. Okay. So it's never one thing. It's, it's certainly several things and that can be one of them. And I would argue the counterpoint to that would be if there was a culture surrounding them that supported them and helped them and taught them and they could learn and grow and and learn how to separate their how not to take it as if their own mother or father died sure. every time a resident dies. Um, that's a skill that can be learned. It doesn't mean you don't yeah, doctors still have, have to all learn the that. empathy and everything, but I think that they, there can be a better job done around the culture, education, training, support. Um, and it's part of what the, the high turnover is part of what drives up costs as well in oh, any sure. industry. So it's worth looking at impacting the cultures. Well, there has been an emphasis now on mental health. Thankfully, it's about time. Um, yeah. And I think that that's part where that could evolve as well. You know, the mental health of employees and, and we're talking about in senior care specifically right now. I'm sure there are plenty of other industries where that would be a, a big focus. But in senior care, obviously, because, again, you get attached. It is a very emotional um, position to be in when you're taking care of older people who are not maybe able to take care of themselves so well anymore. Um, but there should be an in-house counselor for, I think, every single person that works in senior care. Is that being done? Is that a focus? No, no I have not. Heard, I'm going to put that challenge out on one of my next podcasts because I've not heard of anyone doing that. Yeah. I, You and I are, are singing from the same sheet of music. I've always believed that there should be a social worker involved exactly. in the process of transitioning someone into senior living, not just for the resident, but for the family and yes. for the staff. Because just like we talked about, when I hire someone into my organization, it changes the dynamics. A resident moves into a new community. Dynamics shift a little bit. It's just the way it is. Anytime you add an, a new human being, then new family is coming in. And how does that family integrate? Family's not prepared for what senior living is and what it is not. How would They're they? Just you know, how, would, how would they not? Prepared. Yeah. I mean, because they've never done it before, right? I mean, right. There's, there's a first for everything. And anytime we do something the first time, we have no idea. So yeah, I mean, what is the process right now? What's, a, what's a, a typical process? If I need to put my parents into a home, mom, dad, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> but, but if I need to put my, my parents into a, a senior facility, what, what would I expect if, if I was doing that right now? What's the process? Most families think that when mom or dad moves into a community, everything is handled. And that is absolutely not true. So what senior living is not is all of the care. What it is, is basically renting an apartment in a community where you do have a nurse, not 24 seven, but there is a nurse there. You have someone who can dispense medications who will light, do light house cleaning and laundry and who will feed you. Anything beyond that 
if you need physical therapy, if you, my dad was diabetic, he needed an insulin shot every day. Um, and he, he couldn't give it to himself. So we had to hire a nurse to come in and do that. Home care might come in. If they're a fall risk, you might need to hire in home care. And that basically is someone who just sits with them and keeps them company. And if they try to get up, they encourage them not to get up. So um, just a crazy amount of people. There's a doctor that comes in rounds. There's um, hospice if, if your loved one ends up uh, at that stage of their life and hospice care is brought in. They don't move to a hospice hospital, which okay. many people think they do. Hospice actually comes in and provides care in their apartment because that's their home. Right. So when you move into senior living, you the paperwork you go through is basically a rental agreement. It's just like any other apartment rental agreement. So it's like an apartment or, or being in a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's not what I expected. I expected kind of like a full service kind of thing. Um, you know, now I would assume, though, when you go to a, a senior living, living facility like that, that they do have the referral sources. So when you do need that nurse or, you know, any of those other services that they kind of have a, a referral list of vendors that they would recommend. So it, it does make the process at least a little simpler for you, though, right? They do. And okay. they do a lot. And I don't mean to discount the people because this is not a people problem. Sure. People are amazing it's who work in problem, senior right? care. Unbelievable. Extraordinary. They spend during COVID, they've spent their Christmases and their Thanksgivings with their residents and not with their own families because they know their residents are literally dying from loneliness and isolation. Yeah. This is not a people problem. So I don't mean to sound like I'm putting the industry down. I'm not. It's there's opportunities for improvement and pretty massive improvement. And it's a systems problem. Exactly. Yeah. Systems yeah. completely. And, and again, talking about it and making the awareness is what's going to make it happen. Cause again, if you get stagnant, you're just like, Oh, well, this way it's always been. So you're not even, you're not even thinking about it, that it could be different. Uh, yeah. But if we, you know, if you have some brainstorm sessions to be, Hey, look, if it was my parents that had to be in there or if it was me, maybe put yourself in the, in the resident's shoes, you know, what, what would I want? What would I need? What would make me feel more comfortable, especially in the, in the cases of if it's your final months? Um, you know, yes. how would you want to spend that um, arguing over, you know, financial issues and things like that or or being comfortable yeah. and enjoying yourself? So, yeah, it, I think it's just things like most things. We just need to talk about them and bring awareness to it. Copper Coast Gourmet Coffee. When fresh matters, we deliver it from the fields to the roasters and into your cup. CopperCoastGourmetCoffee.com Yes. Yeah. And and anyone who might be going through that journey or getting close to going through that journey, as family members, one of the most important things to do is get a power of attorney for someone in your family for both healthcare and financial. Very, very important to have someone who can take those on. And, and I would also look for local placement people because they can help you. They can help educate you on the best places. They know the owners, they know the buildings, et cetera. So, um, but if I, if I look at that and I think about how that applies to my career in terms of culture and systems and things that have shifted, there's been a big shift in how many women are in tech in the last 10 years, a really, really big shift. And it's new groups like women who code or girls who code, um, women in tech, all, all kinds of new groups and women sort of going off and creating their own um, networks and their own groups because there wasn't a lot of opportunity over here. So right. we all kind of went over here and started it, right? Um, and that's really good. But even when we talk about the Me Too movement, that's a systems problem. There was a system set up that allowed those terrible things to happen right. and not get the light of day seen to them. And the interesting part, as you said, is many people didn't ever do it on purpose. The bad actors are the ones that get the attention. But there were many people doing things like that when I was. I was probably 27, 28. I was um, training. I was doing training for a software company. And we rented a room 
in a kind of a classroom style in the office above us from another vendor who did software training, Microsoft Word training and things like that. If you remember those back oh. in the day when <laughs> the, you actually went to class for that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so I was doing training. We were renting out that room. At the end of the day, I was erasing the whiteboard and the owner of that facility came in and he said, um, oh, that's a nice view. <laughs> and I was like, huh, <laughs> huh, what do I do with that? And right. I was really uncomfortable, but I had no idea how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And I went downstairs and I told my boss, who was a male, and he said, and he was always in my corner. He said, oh, don't worry about it. He's just being a guy. Yeah, because yeah. that's a good excuse. Not okay. Yeah. Like if that happened today, not okay. But back then, that's how the system kind of got set up. And that's one of the reasons I think women had a hard time being at the table of the executive level. It was, it was not a great environment. You had to put up with a lot. Um, I have many more stories like that that are way worse. <laughs> well, and, and that was actually one of my questions was when situations like that happened uh, in your experience, the, the things that you went through, was it more subtle or was it like really direct, blatant sexism and things like that, like in your face sexism? Or was it kind of a little bit more subtle, like a comment like that one there, here and there where it was there and it was definitely there. There's no mistaking it, but it was just more like little subtle comments as opposed to maybe being more blatant by saying, no, you know, you're, you're never going to get to this level because you're a woman and we don't hire women for that level. That's what I would consider a blatant sexism thing. Yeah, definitely more subtle okay. for sure. And Which is, I think just that, that constant disrespect, and then you don't even expect to be put in one of those yeah. positions. You no longer expect it because you know, it's not going to happen because they've built you down so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Exactly. You're exactly right. And it is so subtle that it's also hard to prove, which is the hardest part about all of it. Because of And that's why sexual harassment cases are so difficult because yeah. it's so hard to prove. They may have said these words and maybe the words themselves aren't that bad, but the tone, the, the environment it was set in, um, the look on their face, the body language, can give you a whole different experience of when they said those words and yeah, what and their true intent was. When I was in, uh, in management for many, many years, and of course we had to have a lot of, you know, so sexual harassment training. So in fact, yeah. it was like annual. Um, and we sat in a lot of those. And one of the things I took most from it, and just goes with you know, how hard it is to prove is it's not necessarily what's said, it's how it's interpreted, um, you know, yeah. from the listener. So it's not necessarily what was said by the speaker but how it was received by the person who heard it. And that yeah. person who heard it doesn't necessarily always have to be the person it was directed to, right? You could be just walking walking past that office and heard a comment and that's just as bad. So it is very, very touchy. And like you said, I'm sure that it is hard to prove. Um, and for those who really deserve to be heard and that have been uh, treated poorly, that really sucks. But there's yeah. also a flip side to where um, maybe something was completely innocent. And, you know, I'm being devil's advocate here. Don't hate me. Uh, but maybe something was said that was completely taken out of context and not meant by any means to be anything derogatory. And yet it can be spun towards the, the victim's side. You know what I'm saying? So either way, it could be a really difficult thing. So I think that, that it all comes to to training and just – Man, watch your P's and Q's. You gotta, you gotta be very, very careful. And see, and I just said that. Man, watch your P. It, it, that in 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 this time, just saying that can be construed as offensive. So it's getting really tough to determine what is okay and what's not okay because there's so yeah. many fine lines. And you know, we're in that uh, I'm offended era right now. Um, I, man, I feel bad for comedians this day and age. It's, it's gonna be so hard to be funny anymore. Um, yep. But you know what I mean? Like it just, there's so many things that could be taken in different ways than you meant it. And then you have people who actually mean it in the way that it was taken, and, which is even worse. And that's, that's what we're trying to prevent is the intent of being uh, a negative intent to begin with. 
Yeah, exactly. And and it is hard. And I have seen those cases as well where women will turn it around because they don't like a, a male yeah. and they'll turn it into something that it I never was. Rare. I don't think that that's the norm by any means, though. I, I, I'm sure it happens. I don't, but. Yeah, I don't think so either, but it does happen. So sure. we need to say that, too, because it would be naive not to think that that also happens. Um, I also I. I would say we need to find a way to look at the overall person's life. Like, is this something that happens all the time? Mm. Then it's probably a consistent issue for them. Right. Is it something that one person said and no one else has ever said it and no one's coming out of the woodworks to say it, then it's probably was something innocent. And I think you can tell for the most part, I really I think you can tell based on the person's character. Do they have integrity? Um, take a look I at their Facebook think, page. That's usually a pretty good indicator of, yeah. you know, I mean, you, you can tell a lot of things by a Facebook page and I know that when you're hiring somebody, you can't do that. Uh, but if, if something like that, a charge was brought up like that, I'm sure that you could kind of look back and be like, Hey, look, this doesn't sound like Frank. And you know, this doesn't seem like something right. that Frank would do. Um, yeah. so if you really want to dig in to just to prove your point, I think that's not really a bad area to look in is their social media because people express their views quite a bit on social media. So if they're uh, yeah. sexist or racist or in any type, um, you know, holding any kind of derogatory feelings towards any group of people, it would probably show up a little bit there. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, people's true colors come out no matter what. Yeah. Eventually. It's just um, now it's good that we can actually bring those colors to light and not feel like we're going to be you know, shunned uh, for doing so. so. It's okay to come out. Yeah, this is. Let's go into that for a second, because that's what it was like. And this was this would have been the 2000s. So, yeah, mid mid 2000s. Okay. Uh, I worked for a, a sort of medium-sized company in the Bay Area. The CEO, we were at a customer conference. It was our big annual customer conference. No, it wasn't. It was our sales kickoff. It was our sales kickoff. So there's probably four or 500 people there. Okay. All employees. And I was walking down the hall going from one room to another to present the whole hall is filled. So everyone's like going from their one session to another, the CEO comes up behind me and slaps my behind and just keeps wow. walking. Wow. And like people around me were stunned and they were looking at me like, what's she going to do? And I was so stunned myself that I just laughed it off. I didn't know what I could do. Three weeks later, a female in the organization who was even at a higher level um, filed a sexual harassment suit against him. And as I look back on that, I think, could I have done something different? Sure. And how could I have known to do something different? Because right. I was literally, a, I was a single mom. It, it was mostly my income that was supporting myself and my daughter. And how could I jeopardize my job? And that's what women lived with. Sure. Yeah, because if you do speak up, you're, you might get canned the next day, right? I'm sure that's not why they'll say they'll can you. But well, and see, and that also brings up another point because that's not all right, right? That is not all right. Unless you play baseball or football <laughs> or right. volleyball. So, but it's still a career, still a job, right? So that just goes to show you that when we're talking about how we treat people in the workplace, some of us have a workplace in an office. Some of us, our workplace is on the field. Does that mean that that place, the rules right. change because of the environment that you're in? I don't know. You know what I mean? I think that's a really great question. So, uh, you know, because everybody does that, you know, the, the slap on the butt, you know, when you're playing yep. baseball, you know, it, and it's not thought of as like a high five. That's nothing unusual. Uh, but in fact, it, maybe that has changed a little bit. I don't, I'm not sure. I haven't watched a lot of baseball games lately. So True. maybe things yeah, have I don't changed. Know. Probably during COVID. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> maybe they're not slapping hey, during COVID. You, you, can, you can slap each other on the butt. Just make sure you're wearing a mask and, you know, extend that hand out really, really far. Try to get that six feet. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe it's an elbow butt. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it, it does change. And, and, you know, but when we say that right now, we're, we're laughing about it. Like, oh, no, you know, baseball's baseball. And, 
but maybe in 10 yeah. more years, like, no, that, why did you guys think that back then? It's not okay just because they're playing baseball. It's not okay just yeah. because they're in a, a male dominated uh, industry. You know, it doesn't matter. It is what yeah. it is. And the rule has to be uh, consistent. Otherwise it's not going to be taken seriously. So just things to consider because a lot of those things we just don't think about, you know, you, it's totally subconscious when you're watching a game, you don't even notice it. Right. Cause it's so normal. But then again, 30 years ago, that was kind of normal for the workplace, wasn't it? You know, so, yeah. uh, and, and we brought attention to that. So there's a lot of other areas that we could be looking at. Kathy, yeah. um, that's our time. Man, I went by fast. Wow. I know. That went really fast. I know. It goes by fast. If you wouldn't mind, tell the listeners, you know, how they can get in touch with you. Um, you know, and I know you have a podcast as well. So if you wouldn't mind, throw that out there and, and let them know how they can take a listen and, and uh, talk to you. Absolutely. So you can reach me. My uh, website is serenityengage.com. And our phone number is on there. Emails are on there. Feel free to reach out. I would love to talk with any one of you. Um, and the podcast that I do is called Mavericks of Senior Living. And we interview thought leaders in the industry to put a spotlight on where innovation is happening, forward thinking, modernization, and just moving the entire industry forward is our goal. Beautiful. And I think that's something that definitely needs a lot more awareness. So I'm so happy that I had the opportunity to talk with you about it. Uh, and I'm so happy to hear that there's a podcast out there and uh, that you're doing things like that, because it's one of those areas that we don't think about until we have to think about it. And by then it's probably too late. So um, get the communication out there. Let's talk about it and change the things that, that, that we've been talking about on the show. Exactly. Thank you so much. I enjoyed talking to you. I look forward to doing it again soon. I enjoyed it too. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for joining us this week. Go to our website at thebizreveal.com to catch all of our past episodes. We're available on all podcast apps, or you can watch any of our episodes on the Biz Reveal YouTube channel. I'm Craig Sawyer, and this is the Biz Reveal. Till next time. <laughs>